Perfect. There we uh, go. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, I'm going to use a bit of an old system name here uh, for a reason, but just to give a little bit of a background for where this kind of where this work kind of uh, originated from, uh, as we all here are well aware by this point that uh, systems have become, you know, larger, more complex, and unwieldy. Uh, and you know, you turn turn around it, you know, every, you know, thirty minutes, and they 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 made another change. Uh, but more importantly, is how to actually uh, make the most of it. And so, looking back to the uh, lifetime of Titan, uh, we had determined that eighty percent, roughly eighty percent of uh, the efforts porting code to Titan was spent just trying to understand uh, and restructure the code, and only at, only twenty percent was actually adding anything, any new paradigms or or models or libraries or whatever to uh, take advantage of the say the GPUs or uh, other aspects of its unique structure. Uh, and si similarly, on the other side of development, uh, the system administration side, basically, uh, they there was a big st struggle to just understand how the actual users uh, were using the resources, what was more important than others, and uh, you know where to, where to focus efforts and which vendors to uh, you know, strength and ties to, and so on. So we, uh, we 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 figured that we needed to be able to have better ways of ideally, to s some extent, you know, automatically kind of a analyze uh, large num large amounts and large in size code bases uh, to kind of find different uh, patterns in their behavior or structure that may be able to. Uh, uh, draw conclusions from or kind of uh, move one solution from for, so, solutions from one area to another. And so here we were trying to explore you know a potential method for that by combining uh, static ana analysis with dynamic analysis, specifically taking data from the GCC compiler and uh, analyzing code with that while pairing it with, uh, profiling data uh, and kind of doing all the analysis in an SQL database. So there we go. Uh, so what what I did was I basically uh, I designed a a new it was it was a new tool, but it was really more like a new uh, a new integration of tools. Uh, and uh, to that end, we as as I mentioned, we we had uh, taken the GC comp GCC compiler specifically, we focused on Fortran uh, due to uh, you know just internally uh, we had a lot of Fortran and C code, but we had a lot less to kind of analyze any of the Fortran code with than C. So uh, we we focused mostly on that, uh, but everything in here is applicable to at least any language that GCC is capable of, and if it, it could be an, uh, expanded to others. And we just wrote a plugin for it to, uh, upon com uh, execution of the compiler, it would dump all the metadata. Uh, it'd be, it'd basically, it would be dumping uh, internal structures related to the code in directly to the database. Uh, and then meanwhile, uh, dynamic sampling uh, would be providing some insights into executions with uh, varying parameters. When it's actually ran on the system, uh, so the design was was uh, you know had kind of two two flows to it for collect data collection, and then separate from that uh, is the actual querying. Uh, everything the the idea is that ideally everything would be going through uh, the compiler an analysis in an automated fashion, and then selectively. Uh, as users would be running uh, profiling tests, those would be getting added in as well. And then, meanwhile, whenever you know, as data is getting aggregated in the database, you can you can launch the the queries to fit to kind of analyze what you what you managed to get. And this was initially based off of uh, work on 
uh, Exalt, which uh, was used for like a system analysis tool, uh, mostly looking at you know link time data that can be extracted. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, it was uh, focusing uh, on GC, but specifically, it's it's basically looking at the abstract syntax tree. So it's it's all very high level, uh, and then that way we can maintain as much uh, semantic uh, information about the program as possible. Uh, and this is uh, sort of a temporary thing, but for the time being, we we dump like all the GCC data structures directly as is to the database. Uh, so I'll make another comment on that later. But uh, eventually, the idea would be to have its own structure. Uh, and specifically for the, the runtime information, where we were using R map. Uh, so as I mentioned before, it's a sampling based profiler. So with whatever uh, time interval we set, it'll basically give us uh, sets, sets of stacks, or at least that's what we use from it. Uh, so we'll get file and line numbers for each stack frame for each process and thread in a given sample. And then they'll go to sleep until we get the next one. Uh, and then that, that allows us to combine the file and line information from the code with, with map because, uh, because of that connection. And here we go. So each uh, within SQL, each GCC data structure is represented as a table with its data members, uh, basically think structs, because the majority of them were just simple uh, C structs. And the data members of those would become the columns in the table. And uh, whenever there is a pointer to another data structure, that would basically become a remote key to another table uh, based upon the uh, uh, the object's uh, value and uh, uh, location in memory, and so that means that each each uh, row corresponds to a particular instance of the object, and they just get all dumped out in mass along with uh, a unique build ID uh, specific to GCC. So even if you're running multiple uh, executions of GCC in in sequence. Uh, each one will have its own unique build ID that will allow you to connect the information to that particular build later on. Uh, and then in addition to that, to uh, finish it off, we also generate uh, with within Exalt, we can add in uh, the uh, a, a link ID specific to it so that in the actual data object, uh, we'll be able to get a link ID that we can then also pair in with the, the build IDs that uh, were related to it. Uh, I keep wanting to press right. Okay. So just to kind of give an idea of the sheer scope of information that's at, at our fingertips when we do this, this is a very highly zoomed in uh, picture showing the uh, some some of the different GCC structures. I think there's like 180 or so, uh, and all the interdependencies between them, which basically end up forming the schema for the database that we have. Uh, and again, this is this this is kind of a temporary thing. Uh, eventually, this would kind of go away and be uh, compiler agnostic. Uh, but the work for that uh, is, uh, is still still pending. OK, so just to kind of give uh, a brief idea of some of the kinds of structures that we're actually looking at for that, uh, there's uh, uh, namespaces with, that are, and again, this is for Fortran. So uh, the namespaces describe the contents of procedures uh, and blocks. Uh, GFC code uh, represents base basically what it sounds like. So individual uh, semantic lines of code, uh, including you know assignment, loops, and so on. Uh, the GFC expression is uh, just within uh, code, is looking at you know, things like arithmetic operations and so on. Uh, then there's this, the symbols uh, and symtree objects. Uh, 
to to get at the different uh, variables and uh, other identifiers. And then there's uh, importantly there's also the OMP clauses, which allows us to get information on the different OMP directives that we may have. Uh, so those are those are a small subset of some of the more noteworthy ones, uh, and just to give you an idea of the kind of information in there. So then, when it comes to the dynamic data, uh, where uh, basically how Map works is that each time it stops for a sample, uh, it uh, collects all the information and then it aggregates all this into one big XML file, and we can then process that XML file. Uh, we we use XSL, XSLT uh, to be able to uh, extract the stacks uh, and thread information to the database to uh, and cre create an input to the database and then load that in. Uh, this is at the moment at least at least it's a manual process, uh, but it's it's uh, simple enough that it could be streamlined to be. Uh, done automatically on launch. Okay, so to kind of look at the the tool in a more, uh, you know, in, in practice, uh, we try, we employed the use of CP2K. It's a, uh, from a, an application from molecular biology uh, and uh, quantum chemistry. And so this is, this is going to, allow us to kind of look at some different use cases. So uh, what we're going to be looking at is not necessarily going to be like trying to solve a problem or do an actual profile so much as uh, if you as a potential user uh, want to know something about your code, you want to know, can this, you know, answer this kind of question for me? Can this, uh, can this help me? So this is, you know, what we're going to go through is, you know, some, examples of you know basically those kinds of questions like what what kinds of things might be able to ask of it uh, and so to that extent this is not really using uh, hugely impressive uh, thread counts you'll note but it's just kind of to give a demonstrative uh, example of the actual kind of data you can get from it uh, it's it is using openmp and MPI and CUDA so it kind of gives us a taste of all uh, of the main uh, environments that we want to be able to look at. Specifically, we're looking at the density functional theory method. Uh, everything is run with one MPI process and one, two, four, and eight threads for the uh, dynamic data. And it was run on Titan, uh, mostly because CB2K uh, did not finish getting ported to Summit until like one week before the paper deadline. So it, it was uh, not going to happen. Uh, all right. So what's, what follows is we have some four of, of those demonstrative examples. We have four different queries we're going to look at. And each each one, it, it, they're, they're basically coming in two pairs. Uh, the first of each pair is going to be something that's relatively simple uh, and straightforward. Uh, then the, the next one will try to kind of take that and then build on it a bit to produce something that's uh, especially novel. So to that end, the the first one is uh, if you we if you want to just look at uh, OpenMP regions and figure out uh, where might be some of the the heavy hitters or, or where we should be focusing our attention uh, for OpenMP optimizations. So for this, we we try to figure out okay, well, which subroutines have the the highest number of OpenMP regions, and for each sample, we can look at the deepest part of the stack that we have uh, that's within the kernels and uh, count uh, the number of samples for each file and line combination. And this is the, that counting part is going to be a bit of a theme for this. Uh, and then we take we can take that that data uh, and join it to the information from the compiler to find all the uh, code statements on those lines, then look for which ones were actually corresponding to uh, par uh, parallel OpenMP uh, sections, which would have an operation type of 75 or 76, you know, and then we can finally, you know, do the tally 
uh, to kind of figure out where we're getting uh, most of our OpenMP work. And we can maybe get something similar to this where we can look at uh, the different subroutines that uh, have uh, the parallel reasons we're looking at. And then we can kind of look at those subroutines more in, in depth with future queries. Moving on from that, though, uh, if we want to do something much more interesting, we can uh, look at uh, use of variables spe specifically within those OpenMP regions. Uh, so specifically, we want to be able to do the kinds of uh, line-based or function-based profiling we might normally do, but see if we can't do it on a small, much smaller level, on the level of uh, the actual variables instead. So for, to be able to accomplish that, we take each sample, and again, we look at the deepest part uh, that's within the computational kernels. And then we uh, basically want to try to find all the read-write references. So every time a variable is going to get assigned to or read from. And uh, based upon the uh, actual symbol objects, we'll count the references for each each symbol. Uh, a little bit more on that in a moment, but oh, there we go. Uh, so then we take those symbols and we you know f we filter them down to uh, a few of the top functions of interest that we want. Uh, most likely, this is basically going to be based upon uh, time spent in the code. Uh, but it could be anything. Uh, and then we further uh, break it down based upon anything that's within, any, anything that's contained within an OpenMP region. And we do the same kind of reference counting we were, we were doing before. But what we, we want here, we do this across, this is, this, we do this across you know, multiple different thread counts and, and, and so on. So we, the idea is we want to be able to make sure that the reference count is uh, the same, you know, less than, or you know, or getting smaller, or getting larger, uh, and the idea for, for for that is basically because uh, if uh, if say you use half the amount of time in a particular region, uh, a thread will get half the number of counts, but you'll have another thread that gets half the amount of counts, and so. If it spends the exact same amount of time, you should still get the same number of samples for each section. So if it goes up, then you know that it's not scaling as well. If it goes down, you know that you're getting, uh, uh, you know, maybe super scalar potentially. So that's kind of what we want to be able to look at for this. And here, uh, each line is representing a distinct symbol, uh, and they're adjusted proportionally for the thread count. So again. Uh, flat lines mean that it's it's scaling perfectly without issues, uh, and you can see in this case that a number of the variables get a bit of a bump when you actually go up into using multiple threads instead of just uh, using the one, uh, with a few variations beyond that as well. And maybe that might be just from uh, overhead of thread initialization. Maybe it's from something else. Uh, but when you get that, you can then look at those particular variables to figure out what may be going on and you know, take it further from there. So this uh, approach is uh, very different from anything that we've seen any other uh, seen in any other tool before. In particular, it can account even for uh, things like aliasing. So you, you rename a variable, you alias it to something else, uh, scoping, whatever. It will operate on the semantic level, so it's not. It doesn't. It doesn't actually care about the the name of it or where it is in the code. If it's the same actual data, uh, it'll get tracked individually from everything else. Uh, and so, like, what what really kind of uh, kicks off that is is not 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 even just that uh, it can track at that level, but uh, it's also really low overhead. So no other tool that we know can provide the kind of pro that kind of profiling at the level of the source variable uh, while still having 
uh, negligibly low over allocation overhead, uh, less than 5%. I think it was maybe even less than 2% uh, or, or less than that. I, I, it was, it's, it's as low as you would expect from a sampling profiler. Uh, and the same technique that we use for OpenMP here can be used for any other analysis or code features, uh, as well as the same uh, kind of strategy being used for things besides variables. So for the next thing, we're going to look at uh, uh, library use. So maybe we're just a, a system administrator, maybe, and we want to be able to know, uh, well, what what libraries are actually getting used and what functions are being used within them. Uh, so for that, we look at all co code statements that are of a the call variety, which is uh, is going to get us all the functions. And we we join that with the the, the symbols from from before to get the uh, fu functions name, and we just simply output it as as a list, and we can get. Uh, oh well, first of all, uh, this is this is what it looks like. This is the only query I'm going to be showing the actual uh, full query for because it's by far the simplest and smallest, uh, and. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's something you could actually be followed pretty easily. So this is what something might actually look like if you were to, to construct the query. Just uh, exactly as it reads. You join the code lines with the symbols, uh, connect the, uh, the record addresses, the, uh, basically the variable's location. It's the, it's the way that we actually, or, or the uh, record's location in memory. It's the way we actually rep represent a particular row. And then we just look for everything that's the code type 10, which is the call in a particular module. And then we can get something that looks like this. And that'll let us know that we, uh, for within, say, this library, FFTW, we called all these different functions. So maybe there's 100 different libraries, 100 different functions, or maybe 400 different functions, You know, all of MPI, and maybe you're only using these. And that'll kind of uh, give you some some insight that might help uh, direct optimization efforts. Similarly, you could you could uh, get a little bit more high high level of detail to get the uh, specific file and line numbers as well, so you can figure out where in the code particular things are. If you want to be able to, on the developer side, actually look into some of them to figure out. Uh, the uh, you know what what's going on when you're act in the actual possibly you're calling them. So now, to take this one a little bit further, uh, what if we want to be able to know what's the actual impact on the overall performance for an individual library, uh, for whatever that even means, which I'll get to. Um, so for that, we again we take the deepest parts of the stack uh, and determine which files they originated from. We connect the uh, build and link IDs that we generated uh, when initially gathering data. Uh, and that allows us to be able to figure out which uh, compiler objects uh, they correspond to. And with that and data from Exalt, we can basically figure out uh, for either static or dynamic libraries which uh, samples are be, uh, are coming from time being spent in which uh, object. And then we can do the same kinds of tallying we did before uh, to be able to figure out, well, this much percent of the time is being spent in this library. Uh, this is also particularly valuable for applications similar to CBK, where there's a, a heavy emphasis on static linking of multiple different projects uh, internally. So like DBCSR uh, is a rather large and, com and completely separate project, but it's kind of built in tree and then linked in tree. Uh, and most tools would not actually be able to catch that or things like that. Uh, and you know, if we actually apply that to CB2K, we can see something that looks a little bit like this, uh, with other being everything else, every other library or object, including the main parts of CB2K. Uh, so this is a pie for the entire execution. And we can then see, well, say libcb2k grid is, uh, you know, so much of the uh, 
uh, of the at runtime, and you, this may and this would apply to anything else like MPI or uh, you know a FFTW uh, library. And this is going to kind of gives uh, uh, so kind of how we did a pro, uh, a profile of uh, on the level of variables. This is basically a profile on the level of uh, actual libraries. Uh, oh, I thought I had another slide there. Uh, so yeah, that's. Uh, I guess I need to wrap things up anyway. Um, so basically, oh. So basically, uh, using the information from the compiler and uh, profiler samplers is able to get us, uh, as we can see, we can get a, a much higher level of information about the code uh, than we ever could get before and answer uh, intricate questions relating to code features and structure that we weren't able to do before, uh, but still maintain a very low overhead cost and not per not risk perturbing the application itself and its behavior. Uh, the only uh, issue is that uh, th it comes at the cost of figuring out. You know, we have uh, have to know what to actually ask of the database. We have a uh, bit of an information overload, and we have to know and be able to conform it precisely what it is we actually want to look at. Uh, so we think that the methods that we were able to demonstrate with this tool have uh, great promise for automated analysis. You know, it, the, all the different queries are basically write once, run many times. Uh, level of generality, uh, and uh, it it can it can also be used by administrations to look at usage patterns and direct their efforts on infrastructure. So it can it's a tool that we think can potentially come kind of cut both ways. Uh, in terms of uh, deficits or, or things that have still yet to be done, though, uh, definitely one of the, the big things you know with this is uh, just queries. The more queries, the better. Uh, and the more useful and, and common or general queries, the better. So trying to figure out uh, more of those, just basically getting from users uh, questions. And that's how we did this: is we act, had actual users. We didn't always necessarily know what they were actually running. They just we just asked, "Hey, what do you want to know about your code?" And then we we provided answers. Hey, this is how we could get that answer for you. Um, so just doing more of that, um, and potentially looking at some interprocedural analysis that, uh, for uh, reasons of complexity and and cost, may have previously been out of the question. Uh, we also uh, have been interested in trying to use this to figure out memory placement and in uh, complex hierarchies and kind of predict uh, behavior and how it can change at different scales. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned before, you know, we really ideally would eventually have a, a, a new schema created that's independent of GCC, so it can be uh, adapted to other compilers uh, and add support for C and C++. Uh, a bit more of a high-reaching high thing would be looking at data, data mining and machine learning techniques. But perhaps one of the most, most important things uh, that we're trying to figure out is uh, just how to make the tool easier to use. Um, it's very powerful, but uh, it, it pretty much depends upon uh, knowledge of XQL uh, at the moment for being able to figure out how to actually create and submit the queries that you may you want you may want if they're not already if they don't already exist. So any we're, we're, we have been trying to look at any ways that we can make that a bit uh, lower lower of a bar for people to be able to use it. And yeah, so this was. Uh, Mostly done at uh, at and with ORNL uh, as part of the ECP project, and uh, yeah, that's that's my talk. Great, yeah, thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, we got a question from I mean, uh, Professor Dean here. What kind uh, what kind of tool uh, analyze for dynamic memory allocation or malloc? 
Uh, well, uh, obviously, uh, any time that you make a call to Malik, or for that matter, when uh, when you if this were if this were in C plus plus, you know, if, if for that matter, any time you would you would have a new you know keyword or any, anything like that, uh, all that would be going into the database as well. So uh, you would have one of those GFC, you know, GFC code style entries saying at you know in this file at this line you have a malloc with these parameters, and presumably what you'd be trying to do is you'd be trying to uh, uh, take because you also you, you also have the uh, parameters that you're passing to malloc, so you know the symbols that you're referencing there, and uh, that means that you can actually everything is, is structured away so you can actually know when it's reassigned to. So you can tra trace the lifetime of it between malloc. So if you malloc it and free it and so on. Um, so you can actually, if, if you wanted to, you could actually uh, do something like what I, I was showing before where you're tracking uh, the use of variables, but within lifetimes of a malloc. So that's probably one thing that, that you could do that you might uh, find useful mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So any questions from others? So I have a very quick question here. So do you have any plan to uh, uh, to support support this kind of tool with some realization? So uh, in other words, to to develop some I mean GUI like some normal profilers or <laughs> yeah, it's it's GUI at this point is basically uh, uh, you know pulling out a terminal and logging into the uh, server for submitting some S SQL queries. Um, mm -hmm. Theoretically, anything that you would be able to use with SQL would work with it as well, but that's kind of somewhat sparse and really not what most people expect for GUIs. Um, we did actually, at, uh, for a bit, we tried to look at uh, something called Helical Insight, mm -hmm. and that provided a, a, a way of kind of, kind of t you know, for people that don't necessarily know what the SQL it would just give you uh, boxes, you know, for mm -hmm. the uh, it's like like you're making a flow diagram for the different uh, data structures and or, or uh, for the different tables and and columns in them, and you can just kind of click and drag them over to a box and then mm -hmm. make draw arrows between them, and then it would figure out how to join the tables properly. Um, that was kind of a step up, but we we found that it was. Um, and it, it works. It's better than than nothing. But it, it, we found that it's it still left something to be desired. Um, I recently was talking to some people uh, about how they had a similar problem with their database. They had petabytes of information. Oh, okay. uh, so yeah, it's yeah. Uh, and so they were looking at uh, trying to apply some natural language processing mm -hmm. to it, so that you, people would just you know. Be like mm -hmm. okay, uh, just uh, okay, Google or whatever. Just ask your question, and then it does some mumbo jumbo magic, and somehow comes up with an answer. Um, mm -hmm. It's not clear to me if there's if that could be something that could be applied here as well. But if 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 so, I mean that could certainly uh, help a bit. Um, other other than that, you know, the visualizations we've done so far have been mostly uh, secondary processing. So we run the queries and then we put that into a visualization system. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great. 